Welcome to Bladed Tech Musings, the channel dedicated to retro tech, innovation, science, and technological entertainment. The United States' return to manned space missions, starting with SpaceX's May 2020 launch of the Dragon 2 Demo 2 capsule to the International Space Station, finally resumes an important aspect of NASA's venerable 1960s era space transportation system. That is, of course, a reliable and cost-effective means to Earth orbit from the surface. The space transportation system, while mostly forgotten by the public, has never been given up on, in varying degrees, by the U.S. Space Agency. The STS plan was the original impetus behind the space shuttle program that replaced the Apollo-Saturn capsules and rockets. The shuttle, funded initially in 1971 even before the end of the Apollo missions, was never supposed to go longer than 15 years before being replaced. Nevertheless, 40 years ticked by as NASA struggled to find in its budget the money for a replacement. When the money finally ran out, NASA had nothing to show for after four decades of orbital spacecraft development and no way to send U.S. astronauts into space. But perhaps even more tragically, the second important goal of the STS plan was never realized. This was the establishment of a permanent U.S. space station in Earth orbit with facilities for cargo handling, fuel storage, non-atmospheric spacecraft docking, spacecraft repair and maintenance, fabrication, and traffic control. Fifty years after Americans landed on the moon, the only space station in orbit is the International Space Station, a scientific research facility burdened with a polyglot of competing space objectives, none of which fit the STS plan. It is not a single structure, but rather two structures locked in symbiosis. One section was built by Roscosmos, and the other by NASA, the ESA, and JAXA. NASA contracts with SpaceX and the United Launch Alliance to send supplies to the ISS, while Roscosmos uses RKK Energia, which is a Russian monopoly, to send supplies and man capsules. Let's take a look at NASA's long struggle to put an STS-compliant station into Earth orbit and its future plans for a permanent space infrastructure sparked by the unexpected surge of the commercial space industry. The STS plan was drawn up in 1969, the very apex of NASA's manned spaceflight program with two moon landings in that year. The space agency knew as far back as 1966 that the cost of the Saturn rockets and Apollo capsules, while they were powerful symbols of American persistence and ingenuity, could not be sustained for the long term and still realized NASA's dream of permanent manned space exploration. Over the intervening three-year period, NASA carefully drew up comprehensive plans and budget estimates for what was thought to be an achievable, cost-effective system that could be put into action immediately. The original STS plan outlined a permanent space infrastructure that would support two objectives, an Earth orbit space station and the means to transport cargo and astronauts to the moon and elsewhere in the solar system. To make the station and interplanetary spacecraft viable, the plan outlined the necessary logistical vehicles, namely a fleet of Earth to orbit shuttles and a set of freighters that could ferry cargo in orbit. In spite of a focus on economies of scale, the price tag of such a system was eye-popping, and the Nixon administration took its time pondering over its options. American interest in spaceflight started to wane after 1969, particularly given the ongoing Vietnam War, the Watergate scandal, and the 1973 oil embargo. In the end, only the Earth-to-orbit space shuttle and the initial module of a space station was ever funded. The orbital freighter and the interplanetary spacecraft never got off the drawing board. Despite getting approval for one of its STS objectives and part of another, money was still tight. Apollo missions 18, 19, and 20 were canceled to free up funds for the new programs and a Saturn rocket for the space station module, referred to internally at NASA as an orbital workshop. Designs for the shuttle and the station had been worked on throughout the 1960s, so NASA was ready to kick off development as soon as they received the green light. Work began in 1969 on the space station and then two years later on the shuttle.
Since so much of the conceptual work had already been done before McDonnell Douglas had been awarded the contract, progress on the orbital workshop went swiftly. Dubbed as Skylab following a public naming contest, the orbital workshop consisted of a refurbished Saturn V rocket stage that served as both the third stage of the launch rocket and the actual space station that would remain in orbit. By 1970, a mock-up of Skylab had been constructed, and by 1972, the operational unit had been assembled. In 1973, Skylab was launched in great fanfare at the Kennedy Space Center from Launch Complex 39A. It was to be the last Saturn V launch from 39A, which was subsequently decommissioned in preparation for space shuttle launches. Unfortunately, the first space shuttle launch did not occur for another eight years, a timeline that would result in dire consequences for Skylab. McDonnell Douglas's and NASA's inexperience in designing and launching orbital modules intended for manned occupation revealed itself when Skylab was inserted into orbit. The space station's micrometeoroid and sun shield and one of the two solar arrays were destroyed during the launch, and debris from the shield disabled the undamaged solar array, depriving the station of the necessary power to run it. As a result, each of the three manned missions to the station over the next 10 months, starting one week after the insertion of Skylab into Earth orbit, involved the repair of the damage. NASA engineers rose to the occasion and designed and planned repairs and workarounds that were generally successful and even ingenious. In February of 1974, the astronauts for the third mission finished their maintenance and repair tasks, carefully stored the remaining supplies on the station for the next arrivals, sealed the exit hatch, and returned to Earth. It was to be the last time any human would occupy Skylab. There was supposed to be a fourth manned mission to the space station, but it was canceled. In 1975, the same year the first operational space shuttle, Columbia, began construction, NASA launched the last Apollo mission, this time a crew module docking stunt in orbit with a Soviet Soyuz capsule. No attempt was made to dock with Skylab. In 1976, NASA's Viking 1 probe landed on Mars, sending back incredible pictures of the landscape and a treasure trove of scientific data. The unmanned mission captured the imagination of the American public, making intrasolar system space probes a popular use of the space agency's budget. The occupation of the White House by the Carter administration the same year cemented NASA's focus on unmanned exploration, which was significantly cheaper than Apollo and Skylab ever was. Not helping matters was the struggle NASA was experiencing with the space shuttle, which was consuming money like it had been set on fire. Meanwhile, Skylab quietly orbited the Earth, unused. NASA administrators were decidedly unenthusiastic about pouring money into what was, essentially, 1960s technology and considered the space station an inexpensive insurance policy. The agency projected that Skylab's orbit would not substantially decay until the mid-1980s. Thus, it was with some shock when NORAD, the U.S. Air Force's ICBM monitoring station, sent some bad news to NASA in 1977. Confirming what some in the scientific community have been predicting for years, Skylab was going to deorbit in mid-1979 and burn up in re-entry, well before the availability of the space shuttle. A number of proposals were made to boost Skylab back into a safer orbit, but in the end, NASA rejected them all. The space station was just a proof of concept after all, and in no way satisfied the objectives of the 1969 STS plan. It was just best to let go of sentimentality and allow Skylab to meet its fate. On July 11, 1979, Skylab fell to Earth, spraying wreckage across Australia and bringing the Apollo-Saturn era to a close. April 12, 1981 marked the day of the first launch of the space shuttle, in this case Columbia. The launch was a spectacular success, and like the Viking 1 mission before it, captured the imagination of the American public. 
The shuttle was a magnificent sight on the launch pad, arching across the sky after launch, and even in orbit. It was like something out of a science fiction movie, and NASA earned well-deserved accolades from the space community and jealous stares from rival nations. We covered the legacy of the space shuttle in episode 30, and NASA struggled to replace it. A link to that episode can be found below. The Reagan administration now controlled the executive branch. Swelled with enthusiasm generated by the shuttle launches, the president proposed in 1984 a new space station, nicknamed Freedom, to be constructed in orbit. NASA, stymied for years by budgeting and technology problems, enthusiastically took up the task and initiated several feasibility studies to come up with the best approach to the objective. Werner von Braun, arguably the father of the U.S. space program, but somewhat ignominiously also the father of Nazi Germany's military rocket program, had proposed as early as 1952 that any space station would need to find a way to counter the detrimental effects of weightlessness in space. Furthermore, to make the space station even remotely useful as an orbital port for spacecraft to ply the interplanetary lanes, the structure had to be reasonably large. Von Braun detailed a 250-foot rotating cylinder that provided central pedal force equal to one gravity, attached to a superstructure that provided for cargo handling, energy generation, and spacecraft docking. However, if there was one lesson that NASA had learned from Skylab, it was that it didn't have a prayer in affording the number of shuttles necessary to build such an orbital platform, never mind finding the money for undertaking such a massive off-Earth construction project. After three years of consideration, the agency decided on a LEGO approach. It would design individual Apollo capsule-sized modules that would be individually lifted into orbit in the cargo bay of a space shuttle and bolted together along with a superstructure of solar arrays and supporting engineering equipment. NASA awarded contracts to vendors in 1988 to get started, but things began to immediately go wrong. The first problem was that the entire space station was slated to be built for $2 billion, far less than the cost of one Apollo-Saturn mission. That figure didn't even include the cost of the shuttle launch, which by then was running well in excess of a billion dollars for each mission. The shoestring approach proved to be too challenging to space industry contractors used to continuous cost overruns and schedule delays. Insult adding to injury, Congress subsequently reduced the station's funding. The assumption of power by the Clinton administration, in addition to the cost and technical approach, proved to be the space station freedom's undoing. The program was quietly canceled in 1993, and taking advantage of a friendlier political atmosphere following the recent collapse of the Soviet Union, a deal was struck with Roscosmos to jointly build a space station instead. The European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency subsequently joined the project, and work was started immediately. Five years later, Roscosmos launched the first segment, the Zarya Primary Control Module, and in 2000, long-term occupants arrived, making what was called the International Space Station fully operational. Several years after the establishment of the ISS, NASA fulminated over the possibility of doing away with the cargo handling Earth orbit space station completely. What if, the thinking went, we just made a more robust manned spacecraft and bypassed the need for an Earth orbit transfer point? What if, instead, we built space stations at the desired destination? The success of commercial space company Space Exploration Technologies Corp., better known as SpaceX, had driven the idea of a return on investment in space exploration. NASA had to concede that there was no commercial application for the ISS other than space tourism, a prospect that was already well served by Roscosmos and tangentially promised by Virgin Galactic's near space launch service, and peer research and development, an avenue beginning to be already served by the nascent microsat industry. However, the idea of selling a new frontier had more merit. A moon base or a base on Mars had the attraction of human migration coupled with a rich practical engineering, science, and resource development perspective. To support that idea, NASA could build small space stations orbiting the Moon or Mars instead of Earth to facilitate surface-to-orbit to surface transportation. NASA pitched the idea of a Moon orbital space station, a lunar gateway, to the Trump administration in 2017, and that idea became the Artemis program in 2019. The first segments of the station are to be launched to the moon as early as 2023. What do you think of the United States history of space station development? Does a moon orbit or Mars orbit space station make sense? 
or is SpaceX's Starship concept more practical? Share with us by dropping a comment below. We hope that you enjoyed this briefing on Skylab, Space Station Freedom, and the Lunar Gateway. If so, click that like button. Clicking the subscribe button and the notification bell icon will also help you stay informed when new episodes are released. Links to previous space industry related episodes and our other content can be found below. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. Make sure that you follow our Twitter account where all new episodes are announced. And finally, join us on our Facebook page where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching. Fifty years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers. This time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science and that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go.